um, that there are some people that you just love to hate in life. You know, it doesn't matter how nice they are. You, you may actually kind of like them as a person, but maybe there's just some sort of... Maybe there, it's just natural to have some kind of sore spot in your heart for them. Lawyers, for example. Sorry, Jacob, nothing personal there. But, you know, everybody loves to hate lawyers, right? When you need them, they're your great, you're your great friend. But how do we tend to think about them? Well, no, no, I mean, yeah, we, we try to stay away from them as much as we can. CPAs. I don't know if we have any CPAs, but if you are, I apologize. You know, we kind of think the same thing. IRS tax agents, right? We, we just kind of have a tendency to, you just kind of love to hate those people. And <laughs> it's really funny how that concept gets applied in all kinds of areas of our life. It's not just in the people you know personally. I've come to notice that when we go to our Bibles... There are some people in the Bible that we just love to hate. Folks that, folks that, uh, that if you've studied your Bible for, any, for a good portion of life, you, they, they've garnered that same status. King Saul, for instance. If I mention King Saul, the first monarch of Israel, most of us immediately think about the end of his life. And Saul has, has left kind of a bad taste in our mouths uh, over the course of the time that we've studied him. And, and I'm not saying that, that it shouldn't be so, but you know, the funny thing is that a lot of times we, we kind of forget the fact that Saul had a several years early on where he was, he was a really, really good king. And after he died, David lauds him as having been a really good king. And, we, and, and I don't, you know, for me, I, I've kind of come to the point where I have a little bit of sympathy for Saul. Because he was given a job he didn't want. I mean, he tried everything he could to get out of that job, and, and God gave it to him anyway. But Saul is one of those guys. Another example is Abraham's nephew, Lot. You know this guy, right? We read about him uh, off and on through the span of Genesis chapters 13 through 19. Lot is one of those guys that we tend to give a hard time when we go through a study of the life of Abraham. He's the man who shafted his aged uncle by choosing the better territory for himself. He's the man who was seduced by Sodom and compromised everything he believed in by living there. And so consequently, because of because of those descriptions, because of those things that we read, consequently, people have often castigated and, and vilified him as a man who got what he deserved. Lot was not somebody who needed to be trusted. But you know, the interesting thing about it is that the Bible actually paints a different picture of Lot says something a little bit different than the way that we have a tendency to characterize him. For instance, if you were to open up your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, Peter is describing God's ability to preserve and to rescue the righteous while simultaneously deliver judgment to the wicked. And he uses two examples to prove his point, one is Noah. Noah lived certainly in a very wicked day and God was able to preserve his life. But he also uses Lot as another example and Lot's living in Sodom. And notice what, what it says. He, he'll say down in that text that if God rescued righteous Lot, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. You notice something funny about that word that he uses to describe Lot? Righteous Lot. Kind of goes against the way that we tend to think about him, doesn't it? Kind of goes against the way that, that we have characterized him and portrayed him in our study of Abraham. And so it leaves us with a question, you know, if, why... Do we have such a bleak 
picture of Lot. If Peter, if Peter believed and, and stated that he was a righteous man, why do we have such a negative picture of him? Well, I, I, you know, a couple of things to, to bring out about it. I, I suppose that this may partly come, it may partly be because he is cast alongside of Abraham. Everything Lot does is compared to the father of the faithful because that's the context in which he lived. And, and I will admit, I mean, let, let's not deny the fact that the author of Genesis truly seems to be... Um, truly seems to be trying to picture Lot as a man of lesser character than his uncle. I won't deny that. Lot is set as a, little, as, as, a, as a lesser man of faith of sorts, or at least a lesser character than that of Abraham. And I guess to me, when, when, I, when I was thinking about it over the course of this week, th this was the image that came to my mind. It's, it's kind of like when you compare two paintings. One is done by a good artist... And the other is done by a master artist. As long as the good painting stands alone, it's pretty good. You'll say, man, that's, that's really good. But when you put it alongside of the masterpiece, what does that do to the perceived value of the first one? It knocks it down quite a few notches, doesn't it? And so I, what, I, what I'm suggesting is that perhaps, on, at least on a level, the same might have been done to Lot throughout the course of the years. And so tonight what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like for us to, to do a character study of the man that we often love to hate. And, and I want to take a look at... at three of the major events in his life that we have preserved for us. And, and, and along the way, again, I, let me just state it again, I, I don't think there is any doubt, there's no reason to deny uh, that Lot has several struggles in his life. Lot has some significant character flaws. But what I'm hoping is that perhaps by separating him a little bit from the comparisons with Abraham, that we can... I, I want us to see if there is anything that we can learn from the life of Lot that may help us in our walk before God today. As I said before, there, there's three main stories. There's, there's about four or five things that you see about Lot, but there's three that, that at least in my mind, are, are the primary events that have been preserved for us in Scripture. Uh, one is in Genesis chapter 13, which we had a portion read uh, for us tonight uh, by, by Tom. And, and if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Genesis 13, we're going to reread that section here in just a moment. But, but you have the account in Genesis 13 where Abraham and Lot, uh, they finally part ways. Uh, and, and they go their separate directions. And then you don't read about Lot anymore until you get to Genesis chapter 19 in which you see the story pick... Well, I take that back. There is one section where Lot is captured and Abram has to go rescue him. I'm not worried about that story. That's, I think that's less about Lot and, and his character. But you get to chapter 19 and you really see an incident that involves Lot specifically, and that's the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot and his family are rescued from Sodom's destruction. And then you have the very, very unfortunate event at the end of chapter 19, which for given the setting that we're in, we'll just call it the unfortunate relationship with his daughters. So let's go down through these. And I want, to, I want us to take a look a little bit about, see what it is that we can learn about him. Uh, number one, if you consider Genesis chapter 13, with a little bit of, of extra-biblical information, I, it, I think what this story does for us is it actually gives us a pretty good amount of insight into Lot's way of thinking and maybe a little bit into his character, but certainly it seems to help us get a picture of how he viewed life. When you read what, what Genesis preserves and you grab a little bit of information that comes from outside of the Bible. Uh, but... but um, so a little bit of background that brings you to this point. If you are studying in the, in the Engage series, you, you 
perhaps read that you first see Lot's name in chapter 11, verse 31, when he is in the city of Ur in Mesopotamia with Abraham and with all of the family and with Terah, his, his grandfather. And then they leave and they stop in a city called Haran or Haran. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 12, verse 5, that when God calls Abraham to finally leave Haran, uh, to leave Haran, he, he takes Lot with him. Presumably Lot is too young to be out on his own as his own man at this point in the story. And then when, he, when they go down from Genesis, in Genesis chapter 12, they will leave from Haran, they'll go to Canaan, they'll be there for a little while, but then they leave, they have to leave because of famine, and they go to the land of Egypt. And they spend a little bit of time in Egypt, and that's where at the end of chapter 12 you get that, that, that mistake that Abraham makes about lying about who Sarah is. Okay? And so you get, it's the first of two scenarios where that happens. And Lot is with him in all of that. And as we come into chapter 13, we find that, that there has been some years that have, ha that have happened in between. Lot is now a grown man. He has his own possessions, maybe some inheritance from his father, that he has grown into a, a large amount of flocks and herds of his own. And so he and Abram are trying to, to coexist together. They're trying to keep their flocks together. But, but we find out that, that, that their expansive flocks and herds is causing a lot of tension, especially with, with their, 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 their workers, their servants who, who, work, uh, who work with those flocks. And, and, and they see the potential for this thing to escalate to the point that a fight's going to break out. And Abraham says, we don't want this to happen at all. So pick up with me again. Let's reread Genesis chapter 13, verses 8 and following. Then Abram said to Lot, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, herdsmen for we are kinsmen. If, is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I'll go to the left. Sounds like a good plan, right? This is a logical plan. We have this whole open expanse in front of us. There's no reason why we should have to try to cram all of us in this tiny little spot. Picking up verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zoar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. And then another detail that we didn't read earlier. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Now I think all of us look at this and we, and we recognize that th this is an unusual exchange. All right? And, and it, gives, it does give us a little bit of insight into Lot's character, probably puts a little bit of a shadow on his character. Because you see, in this ancient time, the cultural norm of that day would have expected Lot to do one of two things, either to bargain with Abram about this whole scenario, or perhaps the more noble thing would have been for him to defer to his older uncle as the patriarch to defer to him and let him make the first choice. It wasn't sin per se that he didn't do it, but as the, cultur the cultural norm, the, you know, just it, it would have been the polite thing to do. And the fact that, and the fact that he doesn't, it didn't do that, again, it, I don't think it means that he was wrong, but I think it gives us some insight into the way that he thinks. He sees an opportunity, and he's going to take it. You're never going to be presented with this kind of opportunity again, perhaps, he says. And so he said, well, I'll, I'll take that lush Jordan River Valley. That looks awesome. And, and, and climatologists or whoever have, have, have pointed out that in that portion of the world, it's like a wonderful 80 degrees all year long, or at least in wintertime. It's like an average low of 80 
Whereas when you go over into the Canaan area that Abraham had, the, the winters are going to get kind of harsh. And, and so you, you see the description. You can see why he might have picked that. Incidentally, notice something that the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say that Abraham was left with a rotten territory to go live in. A lot of times it's the way we characterize this, that Lot took the best and Abraham got, left, got, got stuck with the leftovers. The Bible doesn't say that Abram was given a territory that was bad to live in. In fact, if you look at the rest of Scripture, the rest of Scripture calls that whole area a land flowing with milk and honey. So it was perfectly fine for what Abram needed to do. So, but, but I told you, I think we can get a little bit more insight into Lot. So the question is, why does Lot choose this area? Is it just because it has all this fertile, nice green grass? Well, I think there's a little bit, I think there's a little bit more to it. Can't prove it. This is just my thinking. And, and I want you to consider where Lot has come from. Notice that we said uh, that, that where you first read about him is in the city of Ur. Ur of the Chaldeans, as it is called. When you go back and you look at ancient history, Ur was not a small podunk town. It was a major, major city of its time. In fact, ancient historians will categorize an entire era as Ur 1, Ur 2. That tells you a little bit about how, uh, about how impressive and how important it was. This comes from a, from, from a website about, uh, about uh, ancient history. It says, from the beginning, Ur was, not, was an important trade center owing to its location at a pivotal point where the Tigris and Euphrates run into the Persian Gulf. Archaeological excavations have substantiated that early on, Ur possessed great wealth and the citizens enjoyed a level of comfort unknown in the other, in the other Mesopotamian cities. That's where he was born, presumably, and that's where he spent a lot of his growing up years. But then from Ur, they, went, they journeyed north and they came to Haran. Haran, uh, as you'll find on, on some places, this is what we've figured out. Haran was an important Mesopotamian trade center as early as 2300 B.C. That, that predates Abraham, by the way. And it is on a road running south to Nineveh in modern Iraq. So he goes from the, from the metropolitan area of Ur, he moves up to Haran, which is an important trade city. And if you know anything about trade cities, what's that going to generally be like? It's going to be also more of a metropolitan area. And then he comes down into Canaan for a while, but then he goes to Egypt. Arguably, and it's certainly one of the greatest countries of that time. In Egypt, we know, uh, we know from the descriptions that it was a lush, fertile region around the Nile with great metros of its own time. And what does the Bible say? That when he looked out over the Jordan River Valley, it says that it reminded him of Egypt. So what does that say? Well, here's what it says to me about who Lot is. It tells me Lot's a city boy tells me that he is a guy that is drawn to the metropolitan life. Yes, he has the flocks. Yes, he has the herds. And so he has to spend some time out and about. But this is what he grew up in. And so it makes sense that he's going to be drawn back toward those things that have been a part of his life all along. And I think, on, and I think to a degree that that has to maybe have factored into a little bit why he chooses this area and he starts moving towards Sodom, which in that region of the world was one of, if not the major metropolis of that time. If that's true, then it shouldn't surprise us that Lot makes this choice and that he would eventually wind up in, inside of Sodom after a handful of years. Maybe, maybe not. I could be wrong. This is just me trying to figure out a little bit about who this guy is. Well, that's Genesis 13. Now, now go ahead and skip ahead to Genesis chapter 19. In Genesis chapter 19, we now see that God is ready to bring about the destruction of Sodom. It was said at the end of chapter 13, that, that, or at the end of our text that we read earlier, that Sodom was an exceedingly wicked city, right? 
And we know how God feels and acts towards exceedingly wicked cities. If they don't mend their ways, if they don't return to faithfulness, eventually they must go through judgment. And that time has now come. And so it's several years later on, we see Lot as God prepares to enact this judgment. But by now, he has moved into the city and evidently has garnered some level of notoriety with the people. He's sitting at the city gate when you read about the, the, the two angels coming in. Later on, when he has the interaction with the people, with the men who are trying to get to those two visitors, they have a little bit to, they, they speak about him as though they know who he is. He's not a total stranger to them. They are familiar with, with Lot and with his family, so much so that Lot has already, ha he, his two daughters have already been engaged. They're already engaged to be married to two men of that city. And so based on the conversation in chapter 18, we know that God has sent two angels to assess the wickedness of Sodom as to whether it's deserving of judgment. But included in that mission is the charge to rescue Lot and his family from that destruction. I want you to read with me Genesis chapter 19. I want us to read verses 4 through 11. But before they lay down, the men of the city... The men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. By the way, that doesn't mean let's just get to meet them and make sure that we've shown them hospitality. Bring them out so that we may know them. Verse 6, Lot went out to the man at the entrance, shut the door after him and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I, I have two daughters who haven't known any man. Let me bring them out to you and you do as you please. Only do not do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. Now we're going to deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men, the guests, reached out their hands and brought Lot in the house and then shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. Now the rest of the chapter is going to describe details for us some, some very unfortunate catastrophes in Lot's life. Of course, we see that the destruction of his longtime home is coming, and I don't care how bad of a city it is. If you've made your residence there, and you've lived in a place for a long time, and then you turn around and you see it being destroyed in so, in so drastic of a fashion, that's going to be hard to cope with. That's going to be a hard pill to swallow. But then along the way, he has to experience the death of his wife who failed to acknowledge the angel's instructions and she turned back and looked over her shoulder at the city and she's turned into a pillar of salt, the Bible says. And then presumably in later on in what I would think maybe there's some depression that has been setting in, he allowed his daughters to get him drunk and knowingly engage in incest with them. Unknowingly engage in incest with them. Things are hard for Lot. Lot, I mean, and, and this is probably the part of the story where we look and we say, well, you deserve what you got. You shouldn't have been there to begin with. And maybe there's a good argument to be said for that. But as you look at the things that Lot has to endure, as you look at the things that, that Lot has going on, I, I think there are a few lessons that we can glean as we look at Genesis 13, but particularly as we look at chapter 19 and we know the events of what's happening in his life. I think there's at least three lessons that we can, that we can glean out of this. And the first is this. It is possible to be faithful anywhere. The Bible repeatedly claims that Sodom was an incredibly wicked city. We saw it in Genesis 13 verse 10. It's stated again in Genesis chapter 13 verse 13. 
You see the statement made in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 23. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6, it speaks of the wickedness of Sodom. And then in Jude, verse 7, speaks of the sin of, uh, of the sensuality and homosexuality that, that the men of Sodom and Gomorrah were, were engaging in. And many people have argued that Lot compromised too much in order to live in the urban setting. But I'm not completely sure that we can say that definitively. Turning your Bibles, if you, if you don't have it marked, go, go back to 2 Peter chapter 2, please. In 2 Peter chapter 2, again, back in this context of, of God being able to both rescue the righteous while at the same time administer judgment to the wicked. No, pick up with me in verse 7. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. You see, what Peter gives us is information that Genesis doesn't. Peter gives us insight into what, into what Lot was going through day in and day out as he lived in that city. So clearly, and, and clearly I think we have to acknowledge, Peter believed that Lot maintained a righteous faith before God even amidst the wickedness of Sodom. Now I find that incredibly encouraging. Because what that tells me is that life is never going to take me anywhere that I cannot be faithful to God. You and I will never find ourselves anywhere where the only option is to depart from Him. Whether that's in the Bible Belt city of Lebanon, the Beltway Loop of D.C., the skyscrapers of New York, or the proclaimed sin city of Las Vegas, people can stay righteous before God wherever they are. And you know, the thing is, you go to any of those cities I just mentioned, cities that a lot of Christian-minded folks typically don't see as being exactly faithful, you go to those cities, you can find people who are staying true to God. You find the Lord's church in those cities. But as I acknowledge that fact, as I acknowledge the fact that... that as I look at Lot's life, that it is possible to be faithful anywhere, what I also find is that some places will require much harder work to be faithful than others. Lot did not make it easy on himself by choosing to live in Sodom. And we read it just a little while ago in, in chapter 19 that when Lot tried to stand up for what was right, when he said, brothers, please don't do this to these men, what was the response? He was made out to be the bad guy. He was made out to be the one who'd lost his mind and who was trying, this guy's a sojourner and he presumes to be judge over us. Who do you think you are? And this can easily happen to any one of us anywhere that we go. Anyone who stands up for the truth can find a time in which they will be painted as the bad guy. But I think this is especially difficult in areas where God's presence is not strongly felt. And in light of that fact, let, let, me, let me give a piece of practical advice. This is going to go out mainly to our young people. Young people, there's going to come a day where you may decide to start looking into colleges. And you're going to start throwing in applications and you're going to be looking at the schools that you want. Or if you, even if you choose not to go to college at some point, you're going to be choosing what city are you going to go live in in order to start your career. Let me make a strong encouragement to you that while you're sorting through what school to go to, make sure you check out how the church is doing in that town. 
Make sure that you and your parents take the time to investigate what congregations are in the area. Make sure that you take the time to figure out if you have a support system should you choose to go to this school or should you choose to go live in the city. Because I'll tell you what, no school is worth making it, imp- making it more difficult for you to be a Christian. Take the time. I know, it's a, I, I know that it's not something that you see on college applications. I know that it's not going to be something that most of you are going to hear from the, from the school guidance counselor. But please listen to those of us who, who want to be spiritual counselors for you. Make sure that if you're picking a place to go to school or to settle, make sure you take the time to, to, to know if you're going to have a support system or not. Because if you are, then it's going to make it a bit easier to stay faithful. If you don't have a strong support system, you might find yourself in a similar situation a lot. Having to work much harder to be faithful to God in a city that doesn't want to be faithful. So it's possible to be faithful anywhere. And some places are going, to be, are going to require much harder work to be faithful than others. And because of these two facts, here's the other thing you're going to find. Here's the other thing I learned from Lot. That your life will be touched by whatever surroundings you choose. You are going to be impacted by them. For better or worse. There is no perfect place to be able to live. But folks, let me tell you some simple facts about life. You can't walk through mud without getting your shoes dirty. You can't bake a cake without getting a little flour on your shirt. You cannot surround yourself with a sinful culture and not be impacted just a little bit. Lot figured this out the hard way. He and his family were influenced to make some very poor decisions in their lives, especially in the flight from Sodom and afterward. His daughters chose, at least in the heat of a depressive moment, his daughters chose an immoral sexual ethic, and he succumbed to the vice of drunkenness. Does this mean that their whole lives were characterized by this? No. It doesn't. Because the truth of the matter is that once you get past Genesis 19, you don't hear about Lot anymore. You don't know how Lot and his daughters responded to this, to, to this sin in their lives. But the point is the same. Wherever you plant roots, that community is going to have an influence on you and on your family. Which means that we need to take the time to number one, carefully consider what our personal and our family values are. You need to know. You need to know what you stand for. And once you know what you stand for, once you know the governing, guiding, foundational values of your life and your family's life, then number two, you need to determine if your surroundings are more likely to help or hinder the development of those values. And then you make the decision on what to do. You make a decision in faith, trusting God to guide you through wherever it is that you may wind up at. These are lessons that I see from the life of Lot. Maybe there are more. I'm sure there probably are. And you may not agree with the way that I've assessed the life of Lot, and that's fine too. Our study tonight may not change anything about how you feel about this man. But I do believe that his life is a good one to examine because it does connect with us in a very real way. It connects to questions that we must face as we lead our families and as we live our lives day in and day out. And so as we close, my prayer is this. May we be humble enough to learn from this man that we so often love to hate. Tonight, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, you have an opportunity. Maybe you need to make an initial step of faith to obey the gospel. Be clothed in the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiven of your sins, and added to His church. 
We want to help you with that tonight. Or maybe there's sin in your life that you simply need the church family to wrap our arms around you and pray with you and love on you and lift you up to God. And maybe there's good things in your life that this family needs to celebrate with you. Whatever the case is, we're going to sing a song here in just a moment. Song of invitation. Song intended to invite you to respond in whatever public way you may need to the message of God's gospel. If we can help you do that, won't you please let us know while we stand and while we sing.